Aloha, everyone, and welcome to Hawaii Together on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. I'm your host, Kelee Akina, president of the Grassroot Institute. Well, we all know that the Honolulu Rail Project is both over budget and behind schedule, but today we have an expert with us who's going to be able to address that situation and tell you anything else you'd like to know about the rail. Her name is Natalie Iwasa. She's been my guest before, and I really appreciate what this individual does for our community. Natalie is currently an appointee to the Honolulu Authority for Rapid Transit, but in her capacity as a private individual, she'll be sharing today what her personal thoughts are, so she's not necessarily representing the heart. But in in any case, I think you may know her. She's become well known because of her positions and her boldness and willing and her willingness to stand up and speak the truth. Natalie, I so appreciate you being with us today. Aloha and welcome to the program. Aloha, Kaylee. Thank you for having me. Well, if we put everything into context, we started talking about 2012. That's when the rail kind of took off. And it, back then, it was supposed to run from Kapolei all the way to Ala Moana. We estimated that it would cost somewhere between 3.5 and 5.1 billion dollars and would be completed by 2020. Now, here we are in 2022. Well, give us a snapshot of, of where the rail is and uh, w just a status check. W what is the condition of the rail at this sure. point? Well, basically, construction overall is at 64%. And, you know, sometimes we've heard that, oh, we're at 75% because we're at Middle Street. But there's a lot that hasn't been done yet, uh, like the, the stations at the airport um, guideway section. So keep in mind, we're about 64% complete. Um, they're working on finishing up some of those stations there. The wheels and track issues, you know, some people may be familiar with that. That has all been resolved. So that's a good thing. And they're working on their final checklist to um, be able to do the testing for the interim run. So they have to have 90 days of um, no problems with their testing. And then once that's done, they can turn the whole system, the, the interim portion over to the city for their part in actually getting it running for passengers. Um, recently, we had the recovery plan approved by the Heart Board. I think a lot of people are aware of that. And I know, I, I will, I'm sure we'll talk about that a little more. But that plan has to go to the city council. It has to go through a committee meeting and also a full council hearing. So that offers people an opportunity to provide input. and. Something that people may not be aware of is that because the um, system now is called what's truncated at uh, the Civic Center, the full funding grant agreement has to be amended. So that will come sometime, I imagine, later this year. Um, but that's also another opportunity for people to provide input. And then we have um, the, the estimated date of completion that's March 2031. That's for the full line the full 20 miles 21 stations i think you asked for did you ask about hurdles as well well yeah as a matter of fact i was just about to ask that <laughs> okay. uh, there have been lots of hurdles uh, but there are some major hurdles perhaps standing in the way of finishing the project what would those be give us a an overview yeah so i think people are familiar with the dillingham area that's really been a um, sore spot for the entire project um, you know, when they went into there, they didn't realize the, the situation, as often is the case with infrastructure on this island. Um, they have, I think it was 13 utilities that they have to be aware of, and the, the biggest two are the water and sewer. So that whole area is still going to be a um, major issue. Um, you know, they think that they have a lot of that worked out, but there's still some stuff that needs to be done there. Um, the other kind of big area is uh, the remaining funding. So, so they truncated it at the Civic Center for just under $10 billion. But the remaining section has been stated often that it's going to be the most difficult. And you can kind of tell by the cost because um, that portion, along with the Pearl Highlands garage, is slated right now estimated to be $1.4 billion. So that's 1.25 miles of guideway for a huge chunk of money. So those, I think, are the hurdles, at least as I see them. Well, notwithstanding these hurdles, Natalie, uh, and forgive me for the simplicity of this question, 
But do we have a viable project? Does it look like this rail is going to be finished and up and running within a reasonable amount of time? You know, that's a really good question. And so I, if you listen to what the board is saying to the director of the transportation services at the city level, they believe that by um, truncating at the civic center and then beefing it up, that section will be viable. And I just felt that this was so ironic at the last heart board meeting when um, it was stated that the civic center is going to have some BRT, that's bus rapid transit. Now, for anybody who's been paying attention to this project, you know that that was brought up eight, nine years ago as an alternative to rail, but they said, no, we can't do that. Um, so I just thought that that was really interesting. So what they plan on doing is um, at that civic center, having buses every six minutes kind of alternating for um, those going to UH and those going to Ala Moana and beyond to like Waikiki. So um, I don't know, it's just kind of interesting the way that that all has come about. Well, that's certainly a hybrid system. Now, you mentioned federal funding earlier, and federal funding has always been an issue with moving forward with the rail. And it's also been part of the process by which government at the federal level has been trying to either incentivize or, or otherwise put a carrot in, in, in front of the, uh, the heart board. The Federal Transit Administration has held on to currently $744 million dollars um, in the balance right now. Why is it so difficult uh, to get that federal money? What are the obstacles we're looking at? What are the challenges? Well, so what the federal government is asking for and, and requiring actually is that part show that they have the funding available to cover the cost to go to what, well, Ala Moana initially and, and um, with this new plan to Civic Center. And, you know, uh, the last recovery plan was done in 2018, and then it was amended in um, 2019 because the FDA felt that the costs that were being used were too low. So that plan included the P3, the public private partnership, to get that last major contract from Middle Street to Ala Moana. So as you recall, I'm sure many others recall, the city was working on that, Hart was working on that, and it, it failed um, because those costs, when it went to those bidders, I think there were finally two that actually put in bids. The costs were so outrageous, so high that the mayor at the time, Caldwell, said, we're, we're not going to do this. It's just too expensive. So that was a major chunk of what the FTA had counted on in that recovery plan. And when that didn't happen, and then we had turnover in administration and again, higher costs, the FTA said, um, wait a minute, you can't do what you said you were going to do. So show us now again, through a revised recovery plan, what it is you can do and how you're going to do it. So, you know, they're holding on to that money because that's that's the only leverage that they have. If they were to give that money to art, you know, there'd be no really no reason to follow through with whatever they say that they're going to do in that contract other than potentially down the line there could be consequences, but that that's basically the reason that we're still waiting for that federal money. Now, as you mentioned earlier, Hart has already uh, has recently approved a plan uh, to stop the rail about a, perhaps a mile or so before Ala Moana Center, closer to the Civic Center. Can you give us a little more detail about that? Uh, what went into the reasoning behind stopping at that point? What was the deciding factor? Well, the cost and the funding, that was that was the major thing. I mean, you know, when you project that you're going to have nine billion coming in and your costs are at that time were close to 12 or, or more with the finance charges, um, you know, then you can't you can't do it. It's, it's like trying to build a million dollar house and only having seven hundred thousand dollars. You just you can't do it. 
So they were forced into that situation and they did these things called value engineering and risk refreshes, uh, a lot of meetings with the FTA, a lot of meetings with the um, experts and the staff and trying to look at what could they change in the current plan to make it viable, but you know, cut down that cost so that they can build to where the funding will get them. And along with that, they also um, projected the the revenues, you know, the, the GET surcharge, the transient accommodations tax, the new county level transient accommodations tax. They took all of these factors into consideration and came up with this proposal to stop temporarily at uh, the Civic Center. Well, there are other decisions being made with respect to costs as well, uh, such as most recently not to build the Pearl Highlands parking garage, and, and that's caused quite a bit of commotion in, in the community. Uh, how, how will that affect the project as well as the public sentiment for the project? Yeah, that that's a big thing. And, um, you know, really, the cost for that garage is outrageous. Um, it It was... $330 million, I think it was like $200,000 per stall. And to kind of put that into perspective, this is actually in the plan. They had asked a um, contractor who recently built a garage on island, I don't know exactly where, but that cost was like thirty-five dollars to $45,000 per stall. So you can see Hart's estimate for a Pearl Highlands garage is like four times as much. It, it's just outrageous. Um, so they had to take it out temporarily, anyway, they say. And um, yeah, there, people are upset about it. Um, the Mililani YPO Neighborhood Board sent in testimony saying, hey, don't do this. You know, we need a place to park when we, we bring our um, cars into town. We want to be able to park and then take, take the train. Um, and then there were some other people who were upset about it as well. The interesting thing about this, though, is that this is supposed to be a 1600 stall garage. And the impact that was stated in the recovery plan is only 1500 boardings. So my question during last week's meeting was, you know, if the impact is only 1500, why are we building 1600 stalls? Something doesn't jive there. It just doesn't match up. Um, so, yeah, there's, there are a lot of questions with respect to that and the statuses that they're, they're looking at it. Um, you know, personally, it sounds to me like it's not a great place to build a garage because it's, it's in a floodplain and um, they have to build something. They talked about some kind of aerial infrastructure. I don't quite understand that technical part of it, but to me, it doesn't sound like the best place to build something like that. Well, it sounds as though it's a very thorny situation, uh, whether it's built or not built, uh, it, it, you're going to have a, a lot of people disappointed as to what takes place. Uh, Natalie, uh, the, there are additional costs and we have to look at the funding. I, I want to ask you a little bit more about that and what lawmakers are planning to do, but, but we're going to take a quick break and when we come back, you can respond. My guest today is Natalie Iwasa. She's on the Heart Board but she's speaking in her private capacity today. We'll return to Hawaii together on Think Tech Hawaii in just a moment.
Thanks for staying with us. This is a fascinating conversation we're having together on Think Tech Hawaii's Hawaii Together with Natalie Iwasa, member of the Heart Board, although she's here in her private capacity. We're talking about the current status of the rail project in Honolulu, as well as where we're going in the future. Now, let's get back to that conversation. Now, Natalie, lawmakers have to raise another $1.4 billion in order for the project to reach its completion, according to the current projections. What are they looking at uh, to raise that money? And, and in sp specific, are they considering tax increases? You know, that's a really good question. Um, so what we've heard in the Heart Board meetings, and I believe before City Council as well, is that we have this new transient accommodations tax at the county level. Um, potentially that could be used. It is in perpetuity. So, um, you know, there there's that, but it, it's not a lot of money. It, it doesn't reach $1.4 billion for like, way beyond uh, the next few decades. So that can't be the only thing. Um, they also talk about potentially getting some other money, some other federal money, not from the FTA, but other sources. And they, ha they haven't provided any specifics on that. Um, and then I guess, you know, there, there may still be this hope that the state could provide some funding, although Really don't think that that's very um, realistic. The only other place that I can think of is real tax. And, you know, one of the concerns I have, I know other people have stated this as well, is that we still have to pay for the operations and maintenance. So, um, you know, I don't think real property taxes will be funding construction itself because we're going to have that, that money is going to have to be used for O&M. So, you know, it's a really good question. Um, I'm sure that they're going to say, well, we, we do the Pro Highlands garage, we only need a billion and we're going to do, do this change and we're going to get it down to this. But that all remains to be seen. Natalie, uh, we were talking about the 1.4 billion and I assume we're referring to what it would cost to complete the construction. You mentioned operations and maintenance. Uh, that's a lot more as well. Um, my, my question's a, a little more general than this, however. Uh, we've seen cost projections rise and rise and rise over the last several years. How confident can we be in the current cost projection that we've only got $1.4 billion left to go? You know, I... I personally don't feel real comfortable with the numbers because of the history. Um, we, the major contract we have is from Middle Street to now the Civic Center. And we've seen time and time again how those estimates have been blown out of the water. So if that contract comes in higher than what is anticipated or there's something along the um, Dillingham Boulevard with the utility relocation that um, comes up. You know, it's just gonna really mess things up as far as the finances go. So um, I, I, I just don't feel comfortable with the numbers. And, you know, I've pointed out so many times in the past as well, how the numbers haven't been consistent or, um, just not correct. So that's a, that's a big concern for me. I don't mean to put you on the spot, Natalie, but why is there such a lack of confidence in the numbers? Uh, and there, there could be so many factors uh, ranging from incompetence through fraud and so forth. Um, but just generally, I'm, I'm wondering if, if you have any thoughts as to why it is that, that we have had such difficulty in sticking with projections that, that have been made for, for, for the budget? Well, you know, I think the project started out on the wrong foot as far as that goes, because this rail project got funding authorized before a plan was complete. And Caldwell said that in his testimony, I forget if it was 20 you know, 2017, he said that to the legislature, we learned from the past 
And so this time we got our funding without having the planning in place. And then not only that, but the um, contract, one of the contracts was let back 2009 before the full funding grant agreement was in place. And that contract alone ended up costing $100 million more. So, you know, we have this history of things not being done in the right order. To the credit of the current staff, they, they have told us that they've learned from the past, but I think there are still a lot of unknowns out there. Um, we know that the city center is going to be more difficult just because it's a more populated place. Um, but I, you know that I think that just adds to the the question about those costs and whether those numbers are um, realistic. What would you say about the quality of transparency uh, that the Hart Board has displayed, as well as the administration of the, of the rail? Um, you've raised some concerns yourself in the past. How transparent do you, has the rail been with the public? Well, up until the, the, until 2021, I would say um, pretty opaque, actually, uh, because we learned when Lori Kahikina came on board that there was there were problems with those wheels and tracks. I forget which issue came first, but that was a known problem way before it was brought out to the public, and so. Um, that's just one example. I do think Lori has been really pretty good about bringing issues um, as she learns about them or as Hart learns about them. But there are still things that I think Hart needs to do in order to make things um, more transparent. For example, we um, had 25 plus alternatives that were looked at back in um, early 2021. And we've never had a public discussion on them. So, you know, why not? I mean, help the public understand why we're doing this Malka shift and not something else. Or the, the, the plan for the buses, you know, the plan is to create a lot of feeder buses and take away some of the um, express buses. So why aren't we putting that out there? So those people who are planning on riding rail understand that they're gonna have to get on a bus, off the bus, on the rail, off the rail, on a bus, off the bus. You know, I, I think those types of things are still not being discussed. And I'm sure there are other um, examples that people can come up with. Natalie, going back to some of the funding options, what are your thoughts about the assumptions that are being used uh, with respect to the state general excise tax or the transient accommodation tax? Are these reasonable assumptions? Uh, that's that's really a good question and um, one that I brought up at the heart board meeting because um, as a CPA, I've, I've wondered what these assumptions are because they had um, expressed that this GT and then over the next 10 years or so is going to go up. I forget what it was 800,000 or I, I forget the exact number, but um, I'm like, okay, well, so what are the, the assumptions you're using and so now we know are using the actual collections from 2010 to 2019 for heart on um, the excluded 2020 and 21 because of the covid which is reasonable but in that time frame act 1 in 2017 reduced the state administrative fee from 10% to 1% so we had a bump in collections of 9% just because of that and they didn't take that into account when they came up with this 6%, it's not quite 6% increase in the GET over the next, not quite 10 years, but that period of time. And so, you know, when, when we know that something impacted the history of the GET and we're not taking that into consideration, that for me is a big flag. Now, the same thing can be said about the TAT or similar because what they did with that, since um, there's not that much history on the TAT at the heart level, they used the actual statewide TAT collections so for the same period. But in that time frame, again, we had an increase, I think it was from 9.25% statewide to 
to 10.25%. And that again was with the one from 2017. So you have a full percentage point of increase that's feeding into those collections. And you know that wasn't taken into account when they developed this projection. I think it's like 9% over, you know, year over year that they expect TAT to increase. The last thing on that that they haven't considered is Bill 41, which for people who haven't followed city council, that's the um, change of the restrictions in the short-term rentals. So, you know, theoretically, we're going to have a lot less people paying into the TAT, whether it's the state or the county, at least on Oahu. So these things haven't been put into that analysis, if you will. And my question is, well, you know, why not? And how can we, how, how, how can you be so confident that the numbers are going to be what you say they are if you don't consider these things that impact the increases over the last 10 years? Well, Natalie, those are indeed some troubling concerns. Uh, I wish we could keep talking, uh, but we've reached the end of our half hour together. And uh, I, I just would like to ask you in closing, is there something you would like to say directly to the public? Yeah, you know, I just would really like to stress that people should testify. Um, I, I get it. People are tired of feeling like they're not being heard, but it is so important. It is critical that you keep telling your decision makers, your elected leaders, what you think. And I tell you, it's going to stay on the record and it's so important. So that, that would be, I think, the most important comment that I can make. Natalie, thank you for your service on the Heart Board and thank you for being with us today. You're welcome, Kelly. Well, this has been Hawaii Together on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. My guest, Natalie Iwasa, is a member of the Heart Board talking today about re issues related to the rail. So glad you were with us. I'm Kaylee Akina. Until next time, aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.